Okay, yeah, you've got a question. Yeah, okay, so I've got my uh, paper space open and um, I can see, it's, uh, hang on, I haven't started the machine in a while. Uh, yeah, my machine so, is not actually starting, which is not yeah. great. So, so I, I can see a, a list of uh, the uh, directories, like it goes clean image tools, uh, got 0102, blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. But how do I get onto the 20, you know, the, the course two, the current course? Course 2022. So um, you would get clone it. So you would open, so you would open up Jupyter Lab. Um, right. Okay, and just... you'd go into a terminal and you would um, cd to slash docs, uh, sorry, cd to slash notebooks and then git clone and copy and paste the um, the git URL from GitHub. Okay. Let's see what happens. Okay. Thank you. No worries. Any other questions? Anybody having any trouble? Um, getting things working smoothly. I ready and oops. You got no, no, please go on. Um, just a question. I tried to look at my history, my bash history. I tried the uh, sim link. I can see it there yeah. in my home, but yeah. uh, I don't seem to be able to history from my previous session. Yeah, so the bash underscore history file dot bash underscore history file is only created when you close the terminal. So you can't sim link it to it until it exists. Um, and so to make it exist, there's two things you could do. The first is you could open a terminal, run a command like ls, and then close the terminal. And open the terminal again, and now the bash history file will be there because you've done something and you can sim link to it. Or you can just create it. And to create an empty file, in Unix, you just type touch space and then the file name. So dot bash underscore history. Okay. And somebody else had a question or comment? Yes. So my question is about with Kaggle part mm. from last lesson. Mm. So what I understand from, from the lesson uh, you need to either do everything in the Kaggle website, the training and the inference, let's say, or uh, it's possible to train your model in local machine or gradient, let's say, mm -hmm. then somehow transfer it to the Kaggle somehow. Right. So Which what, we're going to do today. Yeah. How? Great. What is the proper way? That was my question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Perfect. I love it when people ask the question that I want to solve today, because that's a, a <laughs> sign that it's a question worth asking, uh, answering, I should say. Um, okay. Well, neither of my gradient machines are starting. setting up instance. That's not good. All right, I guess we're going to use the terminal. Um, now the bad news is that I'm on my Mac where I don't think I've got anything set up. You can use your fancy setup thing script. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's sort of slightly set up. I don't have the Kaggle stuff downloaded. Um, so, all right, well, it's always good to revise anyway, isn't it? So, um, share screen, advanced portion, share. Right. Okay, you guys can see that hopefully. Um, yeah, I wonder if we should maybe make this a little bigger as well. Um, okay, now you guys can't see that. Okay, is that reasonably visible?
Uh, yes, it is. Great. Yes, yes. All right. Um, so, uh, so to, um, this is Tmux, uh, obviously, um, running in a terminal. Um, and because um, I'm sharing my screen, I'm using a you know, slightly lower resolution kind of area than usual. So, a particularly good idea to, to zoom into one of these panes. So, I'll just hit Control BZ to zoom into the pane. Um, and um, let's see if on this machine I already. Okay, so this machine does not currently have a Kaggle directory. So, pip install Kaggle. Great. Um, and if I try to run that, it's not going to work. Um, Do I have my um, SSH config set up? Oh, yeah, that's right. I think Max got some really old version of SCP that doesn't know how to do much. So I might have to. Normally, um, with a current version of OpenSSH, SCP, you could tap complete even to get remote files, which is quite great. But I think I noticed that Mac tends to ship really old versions of a lot of the Unix software, which is a shame. Um, so we we'll have to do it the slow way. So we're going to copy uh, .kaggle slash kaggle.json to here. Oh, why am I putting in .ssh? Move kaggle.json into .kaggle. And that should now work. Great. So um, let's download the data. Um, All right, and we're going to go competitions, Patty, and data, and copy, and paste. Go. All right, and then we're going to let's see if we've got Jupiter running. We do. All right. Wow, it's going a bit crazy over there. Um, so let's open up Jupiter. And if anybody keeps an eye on paper space, let me know if paper space seems to start working. All right, here's Patty. New kernel. Rename Patty. Okay. Um, from fastai.vision.all import star. Looks like this is finished, so we can now unzip minus q, uh, not that, unzip minus q patty disease classification. There we go. Um, oh, you know what we could do? Um, we could run this on my GPU server, because of course running this on the Mac's a bit of a dumb idea anyway. Um, so I don't think we've talked about how to do that before. So this is, might be slightly obscure, um, but that's okay. We'll learn something in the process. Um, so, um, all right, I'm switching over now. Actually, let's jump out of Tmux because running Tmux in Tmux is always a little bit weird. So this is my GPU server. OK, um, and it is running Jupyter. And it says, oh, you can go to localhost 8888 to use this. But I can't because 
that's not localhost refers to the machine I'm currently on, and I'm not on this machine. I'm SSHing into a remote machine. Um, but what I've done, and uh, as I say, this is like something that not everybody needs to know about for sure, but for those who are interested, what I've done is um, when I SSH to this particular uh, machine called local, it forwards anything that I use on my local machines port 8888 um, to the remote machines uh, 8888, um, which means that I can use um, localhost 8888 and it will actually forward those packets to the remote machine and forward remote machine packets back to here. So this is called SSH forwarding, um, you know, FYI. Um, so if I, go here, um, oh, and the other thing we should probably do is make sure that Jupyter is not running on the local machine. So I'll cancel that. And so uh, to, to exit out of this, I could create another window or another tab or whatever, but I can just hit Control BD to detach from TMUX. So that stuff's all running still in the background. Um, and then I can SSH to my machine. Um, and let's see if that's all working. There we go. Okay. Um, so that's great. And so here we actually have that going so we can create a new notebook. Um, <clears throat> and it's easy enough, by the way, if you do like buy a machine with a GPU, which um, it's not a terrible idea, um, especially if eventually GPU prices start to come back down to reasonable levels at some point. Um, you know, it doesn't need to be a notebook or anything. You can chuck it anywhere in the house, just like I've done. And as you can see, log into it from your um, computer. Now, um, I can only log into mine, right? You know, by default, I'd only be able to log in from home. Um, um, if you want to be able to log in when you're not at home, you would have to go into your router's settings and say forward port 22, which is the SSH port. Um, to your GPU server. Um, and you'd also have to know the um, IP address that your house's Wi-Fi is on, and that tends to change. Um, so you can use something called dynamic DNS. Um, there's lots of different providers of dynamic DNS. So I use something called din.com just because they've been around forever. Um, and so, yeah, so I can log into my machine from, from anywhere, which is, which is very nice. Okay, so let's try this again. From fastai.vision.all import star. Um, all right, and so path equals um, so we can do ls in bash like so. Here we go. Great. So we can just use the current path is where our data is. Um, and so our training path, oh, and we're also, oh, that's fine. Um, and then our training path is um, path slash train images. So I'm not sure we've really talked much about path lib before. So this um, this path object comes from a Python class called path lib, um, and it's imported by default with pretty much any fast core or fast AI thing you use. Um, so to learn about it, obviously you can just Google for path lib. Um, but basically, um, yeah, it lets you create a path, this is, you know, a path in your current working directory, or you can do something here to go to a relative directory, or you can go to a um, absolute directory, and then you can, you know, it's kind of got this somewhat neat um, um, use of the slash operator to mean, you know, go to a, a, a subdirectory, 
Um, .ls doesn't come with it by default. Fastcore adds that to, to list things, as you see. Um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. And so the other thing we did yesterday was we looked at the files, get image files inside. Um, let's have a look at the ones inside the training path. And so we could create an image. Um, we can look at it. It's size, um, which is a property. Okay, so there's a few things we can do that kind of gets us back to where we were yesterday. Um, so a question I saw in the forum was, um, how would I get like the sizes of all of the files? Um, that, well, it actually showed how to do it um, kind of slightly slow way, which is, let's do it the slightly slow way and time how long it takes. Um, sizes equals, um, let's just copy that. Paste that here. O dot size for O in files. Um, oh, keep doing Please. that. Yeah. Yes. Is there a question coming? Um, so to do this in parallel, um, which would obviously be faster, uh, one would expect. I mean, it would depend. If the most of the time is spent reading this from the disk, then doing this in parallel won't be any faster. Um, if most of the time is being spent decoding the JPEG, then doing this in parallel will be faster. And which of those is true will depend on whether we're using an SSD or not. Um, so anyway, I'll show you how to do it. So if you um, import uh, fastcore.parallel, which is a module, that module contains a function for parallel, um, which applies this function to these items. Um, so the function we want to apply um, is, um, and let's uh, look at the doc for it. Show in docs. Um, so here's an example of parallel. Um, oh, that should be ordered, but never mind. So here's something that takes two things, X and A, and adds something to each one. And so here's how we use parallel. Um, the, the docs for fast AI libraries are a bit different to, to some in that the tests and the docs are all one thing. So to read this, this is saying, if you call parallel, passing it this function, which which is just x plus a, where a defaults to one, um, and you do it on this input, which is range 50, um, then you would expect to get this output, which is the range from one to 51. So this kind of is showing you lots of examples of using the function and telling you what you would expect to get for each one. Um, so um, if we want a function which is going to take um, some file and it's going to return this, like so. Um, and so if we want to run that in parallel, then we can say parallel. And the function we want to run is this function, and the files we want to run on is files, and there's lots of other things we could pass in. So like, let's say we want to do it on four parallel workers, see if that ends up any faster. So as you can see, running stuff in parallel when you use fast core is actually pretty fast and easy. Um, but as I say, it doesn't necessarily result in a speed up if the main thing that's taking time is getting stuff off the disk, um, then it won't be faster. Okay, so in this case, it was a bit faster. Um, I think that, I think 
they use really slow disks um, on, oh, actually this is my disk, no, this, this is a good disk, so that ought to be fast. Um, so we could see if increasing it further is faster still. My guess is we've probably, but we'll see. So Jeremy, quick question about this. Yeah. Um, does this use CPU uh, cores or is yeah. it using the GPU or running C it in parallel? CPU. Um, so the GPU is only used for um, for um, models, basically. Um, pretty much everything oh. else is going to be done on CPU. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. So that's definitely worth the speed up. Now, um, I I don't normally create a function to do one thing like this. Um, it, what I would normally do instead is to use a lambda expression. And so to use a lambda expression, it's just basically it's a function you define in line. You just type lambda and you say the argument and you don't have to say return. And so then we can get rid of the definition and run. Uh, Oh, okay, so that's interesting. So we can't use a lambda with parallel. Oh, I guess I did know that now I think about it. All right, that's fine. We won't use it then. Parallel processing on Python is notoriously crappy. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, it, it has a lot of limitations, including now I think about it, not being able to use lambdas. Um, okay. So then um, we created our data loaders, um, image data loaders dot from path um, folder. And uh, we passed in the training path. And valid percent. And I think we want some uh, resize transform as well, right? Cool. So, um, and so then we created a model, learner. Um, So last time we used ResNet 34, um, but what I'd be inclined to do is to head over to Kaggle and look at the, which image models are best and see if there's something we might want to use. It's better than ResNet 34. Uh, so um, this is showing speed in a log scale. And this is showing accuracy on ImageNet. Um, and the different colors are various different kind of families. Um, so um, ResNet is this family here. And things like ResNet 34 are not particularly great, as you can see. Um, So let's try using conf next base in 22, blah, 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 instead. Um, okay, so vision learner, we first pass in the data, data loaders. And so um, these um, image models here are from um, uh, a library called Tim, um, which to use it, you need it installed which I probably have installed, but just to check. Yep, that's already installed. Um, and you can check out things on Tim, such as, so if you import it, then you can say Tim dot um, list models, and you can pass in basically a glob. So I want to look at conv next models. 
see what options there are, uh, mainly because I just want to copy and paste. And so, okay, so there's base, there's small as well, small. Now, why is small conv next? If you double click, you'll get this. There's base, large, extra large. That's weird. For some reason, um, the small one's not appearing. Um, and there's also mm. a tiny. Hi, Jeremy. Yeah. I I think they added the small and the tiny one in the last version of Team that is not in the pip install version. Right. Okay. So, oh yeah. Um, we need to install the dev version of it. Um, correct. Yes. Thank you. Um, so Ross, who run, who creates Tim. Um, created a pre-release version 0.62. And so to install that, we would need to um, uh, call minus U for upgrade. Oh, just one moment, please. My daughter's having computer problems. Um, all right, uh, Tim, uh, greater than uh, 0.6, they're equal to 0.6.2 dev, I think something like this. I'm not quite sure. Oh, it says I've already got 0.6.2 dev installed. Um, oh, I see. So I've got it on my machine, but it wasn't on the Kaggle machine because I didn't install the, that version on Kaggle. Okay. Cool. Um, well, we may as well fix it on Kaggle just so you see how these things work as well, um, because there's actually something quite nifty here. So we'll click Edit on Kaggle. And we'll start it here somehow, but that's okay. Copy. Um, oh, all right. It's he doesn't have it in his data, I guess. All right. So not much we can do about that. All right, well, I think we should just go ahead and try one of the smaller ones. So conf, let's try small. So that has to be a string when you use Tim. Okay. Let's see what happens. So um, when you use a pre-trained model, it needs the weights. And so the first time you use it, um, it downloads the weights. Um, depending on how much space, if you're using paper space, depending on how much space you have and how long this takes on paper space, you may want to consider um, sim linking your home directories dot cache slash torch um, into slash storage. Um, and that way you won't have to download these. Not that it seems to take too long. I don't know if you care or not. Um, you know, one thing we might want to do, well, let's let's just start trying to find units, shall we? Um, yeah, that's good, seems to be working. Let me know if anybody's got any questions or thoughts along the way. So when it fine tunes 
Oh, okay. So the other thing we want to do is tell it that we want to keep track of the error rate. Okay. That's going to help. So yeah, so when we fine tune, um, just create another, get a copy. Okay. Um, So we can look at the source code to see exactly what it's doing uh, when we call fine tune. Um, so what it's actually doing is it's um, calling freeze. What that does is it um, says all of the weights except for the very last layer, your, the optimizer is not allowed to change. Um, so if you think back to that Siler and Fergus paper we saw with the different layers and the different like you know, the later layers are more and more specific. Um, so initially, we just want to um, fit uh, fit the last layer. So it calls fit on the last layer only. Um, and then it decreases the learning rate and then unfreezes. Um, so then it says, OK, you know, you can train the whole thing. And then it trains the whole model for however many epochs we asked for. So we can see. So generally speaking, fast AI methods or I mean pretty much any methods I write tend to be very small so they're designed to be reasonably easy to read the source code and see what's going on um, at least if you're reasonably comfortable with Python. Um, oh and I just thought of something else we should do which is if you are using a GPU released in the last I don't know four years or so um, it's very likely that it'll be much faster using um, what's called half precision floating point, which is basically like less less precise numbers. Um, it, it'll be way, way, way faster. Um, most of the time on Colab and Kaggle, you're not going to get uh, one of those more up-to-date GPUs. Um, but having said that, there's really never any harm in using um, half precision floating point. Um, and even if you use an older GPU, it's still going to save memory. Um, so actually to ask um, uh, fast AI to do that for you, you can add two floating point 16, as in 16 bit, um, at the end of your learner command. So um, yeah, so when this finishes, we well, might try rerunning it. Um, with this instead. Excuse me, Jeremy, I'm just following along from Paperspace. Um, and if I don't want to bother with uh, importing Tim just to keep up, what, instead of using conv next, what would, a, what would be a, a good default to use? I mean, why not use conv next? What's your, I don't know. I, um, I guess, because um, I, uh, I would need to import. Tim, I think I missed that bit. <laughs> so pip install Tim. Yep. Um, or if you want to get the more recent um, models, such as the one we're using, then um, um, pip install. Let me copy this for you. Um, So that's the command there, and I'll put it in the Zoom chat for you. Great, thanks. Okay. <clears throat> and Jeremy, just while we're um, while we're talking about you know fine tuning and and as that's going on, um, I don't know if anyone else would find it helpful, but I mean obviously like conceptually understand what's happening with fine tuning, but um, I don't know if anyone else kind of feels like uh, trying to understand better what's actually going under the hood with fine tuning, like what's actually being altered. With within the model, like more than just at like a kind of a, a, at a high level. I'm just trying to get a bit of a, a better grip on 
yeah, like what exactly we're fine tuning and, and how it's going about fine tuning it, I guess, just under that, that first surface level. Just want to make sure I understand it better. Yeah, so um, so we just looked at the source code for it. Um, so what um, what what yeah, what did you want to go? Which bit of this did, did you want to look deeper at, or like what did you? Yeah, tell me tell me more. What do you want to know? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, like stepping through it. So like we we you've got it frozen at a particular point, right? And then this fit one cycle. So just um just going through the definition of fit one cycle again. Um, oh, so we haven't so, done that yet in the course, I don't think. Um, yeah. So yeah, so we can certainly talk about that. Um, I, I don't want to hijack things. So if other people want to kind of move on, that's fine. I, I can follow it up later. But I just um I just kind of wanted to get a bit of an overview of of what's actually going on there. Let's take a look. Fit one cycle. So, um, so we we'll look look at the docs. Here it is. Um, so, what does fit one cycle do? Uh, so, actually, there's a paper you can read if you want to know exactly what it does. Um, but the, there's a picture here which tells you what it does and um, what this picture is, is so fit one cycle uses something called a scheduler. And a scheduler is something which actually changes the learning rate during the um, training. So remember the learning rate is the thing we multiply the gradients by before we subtract mm -hmm. from, the, from the parameters. Um, when you have a randomly initialized model or even a pre-trained model, we actually randomly initialize the last layer of weights. Um, so at first, even a pre-trained model that we're fine tuning um, can't do anything. It's, ra it's, it's still giving random answers. Mm. Um, and so that means we want to use a really small learning rate because um, it, it's, very, it's very difficult to get to a point where it's starting to learn something slightly useful. And so um, when we start training, the first few batches use a tiny learning rate. Um, and then as it gets better and better at like doing something useful, you can increase the learning rate because it's it's got to a point where it's like, yeah, it's kind of knows vaguely what it's doing. And so as it mm -hmm. trains, the learning rate goes up and up and up and up and up. And then as you start to get close to the answer, you need to decrease the learning rate again. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that um, you're really fine going to small little steps. You're really, really close now. So when you- so so, so, so you're saying there. So, as you get closer to the answer, like, are we saying that that's in comparison to the validation set? So that we're, so that we're moving away from overfit, uh, where those might, yeah, I guess where the um, nothing to do with the training score and validation or training score? or anything. This is just so. So this is just a plot of of um, the curve of batch number against learning rate. So this is okay, this but... is the, this is the shape, the exact shape that is used. There's nothing clever going on. It just it just follows this exact curve. Oh, okay. So there's no there's that's not interacting with anything else to no. derive those numbers. It's just no. doing that. Okay. All right. Understood. Right. So in fact, um, if we look at the source code for it, um, what it does is it calls something called combined cos. Mm -hmm. I can look at the definition of. Um, which is something that uses two cosine schedules. And so a cosine mm -hmm. schedule is one that, uh, so it's also known as an annealer, it's called learning rate annealing, is something mm -hmm. that literally uses cosine. So, Got it. Yeah, that's it. Yep. Okay, that, that, that's helpful. So I, I, I get now kind of where that's mapping to that, that idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, for people who are interested in going deeper in understanding like what does fast AI do and why and what what actually makes what's important in deep learning and stuff. This is how exploring the documentation and source code of fast AI, when you're at a point where you feel this is what you're ready to do, um, can be super useful because the, you know the documentation can tells you what paper is being implemented and why and shows you pictures of what it's doing and the source code is something that you can copy and paste into your notebook and try it for yourself and so forth. Um, yes. Did you have any other questions about this uh, 
no, 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 no that, that's that, that's fine for the moment. I don't know if anyone else does. All right. I, I just wanted to uh, comment that Sylvain had a very good blog post explaining the fit one cycle uh, policy. Yes, he does. Okay. Ah, perfect. And so there's other policies you can use, like the triangular version. So this is actually and what we originally did, I think, for one cycle. As you can see, it ends up being pretty similar. And what what would be, I guess, the criteria for where you would change that policy? Like, like what would, I guess, what's the basis for the decision you make about changing that policy? I mean, you don't, basically. It works fine and you just do it. Yeah. Okay. Like, All right. So it's, it's pretty arbitrary. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, no, it's not arbitrary. It's something that lots of experimentation has found that this works well. Oh, uh, okay. Right. Like, like everything pretty much in fast AI, we try to find the things that work well and um, yep. the things that need changing, we generally tell people all about them, but this is generally something that doesn't need changing too much um, okay. at all. So is this related to learning trait finder? Um, is that... um, okay, so let's talk about learning rate because finder. I'm uh, finding it quite confusing which I was actually which which um, number is correct with learning trait sure. finder. And... So um, just before we do that, I'll just point out so the, the mixed precision version on my RTX card, um, which is a consumer GPU, um, the speed's gone from a minute 41 to 28 seconds. So you can see it really does make a huge difference to use FP16. Um, so um, this question is about something called the learning rate finder. Um, so the learning rate finder does something um, very similar to one cycle, um, the one cycle scheduler or one cycle annealing, which is it gradually increases the learning rate while it trains. Um, but it actually only does um, up to 100 um, batches. So generally speaking, far less than even an epoch. And it doesn't increase the learning rate and then decreases it again. It just keeps increasing the learning rate until the whole thing falls apart. And so um, this is a graph of the learning rate. And remember, it, it, it increases it logarithmically increasing every batch. So this is also kind of a graph of time of batch number. And then it shows you what loss it got. So for batch, the first few batches, it got a loss of about four. And until it got up to a learning rate of about 10 to the negative four, it, nothing really improved. So clearly learning rates of less than 10 to the negative four aren't very useful. Um, and then as it increased the learning rate, you can see the slope started to get steeper and steeper. And so this area here is the point where it's learning the most quickly. And then it gets to a point up here where it's too high. And when it gets too high, initially it just doesn't really improve at all. And then it gets really too high, it jumps past the answer, right? And starts getting much worse. Um, so the, um, yeah, so um, it, I generally just pick somewhere visually around the middle, um, or you can, you know, see it says something around 0.001. Um, so is the, is the magnitude of, of that thing or what, why, why we wouldn't choose the minimum here? I mean, like, okay. This one the, here? Like, sorry, that, that's what I thought like, <laughs> that right. would make no, sense. This would, be, this would be a really bad spot, right? Because at this point it's not learning. So what you want to look at is the, is the gradient. You want to look at the slope of this line because the slope is how quickly is it improving. So at this point here, at this learning rate, it doesn't improve at all. So if we use this learning rate. It, so would it that make sense to use gradient actually for this? Yes. to see what's the minimum the, the main, the, rather than doing that the, visually well not necessarily because you see here there's a really steep gradient but that's definitely a bad spot true okay sorry <laughs> so i mean don't be sorry it's a great question like it's surprisingly difficult to come up algorithmically with the thing that our eyes do when we say like oh we're about so somewhere around here um wouldn't so, that be local mini minimum no, sorry. <laughs> no, because the minimum is down here, which is definitely not what we want. And sure. the minimum gradient would be here, which is definitely not what we want. Um, I'm, I'm not saying it's possible. It's totally possible. But um, the, the learning rate finder
Um, so Zach Mueller actually um, spent a lot of time trying different things and wrote a whole blog post for his company and came up with four different approaches, all of which actually don't work too bad. Um, and you can actually look at all of them by saying, what suggestion functions do you want to use? So, paste. Um, and I wonder if there's... Oh, we probably should have a link to Zach's blog post in the docs because that would be quite helpful. Google for it. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'll ask Zach about that. Okay, so um, yeah, so you can see minimum. It's actually one of the suggestion functions, but I don't actually know why it's even there because you'd never use it. Um, and so minimum will the plot will be in the minimum, but the suggested value is still like it's like ten, like divided by ten. Oh, is that what happens? Minimum. Plot yeah, like you see oh, the minimum I see. Value. So it finds the minimum divided by ten. Ah, got it. So we should probably plot that then uh, on the minimum rather than plotting what's effectively ten times that. Okay, thanks for explaining. Um, yeah, so you can see all these numbers are all in the same order of magnitude. Um, and the default is 0 0.002. Um, so is this something that FastAI use, uses underneath the hood? Or I mean, like, no. what's the benefit of, of changing this learning rate uh, manually or, or trying to find um, it? With a... some, so most of the time our default works perfectly fine, which is why I <clears throat> um, don't talk about this as much as I used to actually. Um, but, you know, sometimes some data, well, particularly like for a tabular data set, the learning rate can be almost anything. Um, it really dep does depend on the model. I, I find most, um, um, pretty much all computer vision models seem to have pretty similar learning rates that are useful. So the defaults generally work pretty well. Um, but yeah, if you try something and it doesn't seem to be training particularly well, just try running the, you know, the first thing I'd try would be try running LR find just in case the default learning rates nowhere near the recommended values. Um, and then you could try yeah, you could just try some different number. Um, but yeah, these are all very close to our, to our default anyway. So I, I wouldn't bother in this particular case. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no worries. These are good questions. Uh, okay, we've got a model. Um, I'm actually going to have to train it again because I just created a new learner for the purpose of that. Um, and so the next thing we're going to have to do is to um, apply it to our training set, sorry, to our, to our test set um, in order to submit to Kaggle. Um, so the test set, it's always good to have two windows, two tabs going on because that way we can start working on the next thing while this is training, right? And you can see it's still training because the little hourglass icon is there in, in the fab icon. Um, so there's something called uh, test underscore DL, which for some reason is not appearing. It must be from some different part of the library. I test DL data core from fast AI dot data dot or import star. Something silly. Oh, it's a method. Okay. My bad. Yells dot test deal. Okay. Stop. No, doc. Okay. 
All right, so this creates a test data loader. So a test data loader is a data loader used for inference of a bunch of things at once, basically. Um, so there should be an example down here. Okay, so a test DL is something that we pass some items to. Um, so I don't know, like Radek, Tanishk, anybody else? You know, I'm thinking I'm just going to call get image files on the test set and pass it to test DL. Is that what you guys would do, or do you have a better better way to do this? Uh, yeah, I think that should work. Okay. I don't know, like what people, you know, I, I don't do nearly as much inference stuff as most people, so I never quite know what the fast AI community's preferred idiomatic approach is. Um, test images. Test images. Test files. Okay, so we've got 3,469 files to apply this to. So, um, so we could create a test data loader. And that's going to be dls.testdl uh, with those files, I guess. And we should be able to go testdl.showbatch. So I do always like to see what I'm doing, you know. Um, so that looks hopeful. And so a test data loader, the, the key difference is that it doesn't have um, labels, right? So there's no dependent variable. Um, all right, so then I guess we would go uh, learn. Is it dot get preds or dot predict? I never quite remember. That's an item, so I guess it's get preds. We need better names for these. It's not obvious. Okay, and then dl data loader equals the test data loader. Oh, and I should have assigned that to something, obviously. That was a bit silly of me. Um, and also, we should look at the documentation for it. Still not used to Mac keyboard shortcuts. Doc, paste, giant docs. Uh, get the predictions with some particular data loader. Um, it can optionally return the input. It can optionally return the loss. We don't need any of that. Um, uh, okay, so what I think we should do is we should look at Kaggle at this point. And actually, we don't even need to look at Kaggle. What Kaggle normally does is they provide us with a sample submission. Here's one here, right? So let's look at the submission. Sample submission equals pd.readcsv. And notice in Jupyter, if you start quotes and you press tab, it will tab complete file names, which is nice. Okay. Not a very useful sample submission, um, unless there's something wrong with Python. This is not a great sample submission, but they just want the name of the class, how it appears. Uh... I see. What a terrible sample submission, particularly for a training one. You would think they would <laughs> be more helpful. So they just want the text of the name of the class, do they? Yes. Um, I mean, obviously, we could actually <laughs> look it up and find out rather than guessing when you don't have Radic on the line to tell you the answer. Or maybe you can just call Radic and ask him. So data uh, evaluation, yes. See, they've actually got a sample here. Yeah, all right. Um, so let's try that. So preds equals and um, so by default, it's going to return the probability of every class, um, which we can certainly turn into what we want. But I think if we call with decoded, that will do it for us. Does that sound right? You can see I'm so out of practice with this. OK, it's pretty close, right? It's given us um, the, the indexes of each one. Um, so this is actually going to be a really good exercise. Um, so in terms of like what's in there, there's three things. Um, there's the probabilities. Um, there's something we don't care about. And there's the um, indexes. 
so these are the indexes. So what are these indexes of? They're indexes into the vocab. So if you remember, the vocab is the tells you what's what. Right. Um, so we need to convert these predictions into these pieces of these strings. Um, so the first thing I'd probably be inclined to do is to maybe turn that into a pandas series. Um, and so IDXs. I guess we should to give it a name as well. There is okay, so let's call these indexes. Oopsie daisy. Oh, and it's called whoopsie daisy. It's called named. Okay. So there's a pandas series and um, I always find pandas, the pandas API difficult to remember. It's, I don't find it particularly consistent or intuitive, but there is um, a dot map function, which I think we can look up in to dl's dot vocab category map is not callable fair enough so dl's dot vocab um, is although it looked like a list I guess it's not one but we might be able to turn it into a list normally you can turn things into lists like so yes we can let's see if that works Oh, okay, that's annoying. Um, so I'm pretty sure that you can pass a dictionary. Yes, you can. Um, and I thought a, a list would count as a dictionary, but apparently it doesn't, which is, I mean, about mapping. So a mapping just basically refers to something that behaves like a dictionary. So we actually have to create a dictionary which maps from the index to the name which is um, a bit of a pointless thing to do in a sense, but that's okay. Um, so for k comma v in, uh, so if we enumerate through that, okay, so that's, a ma that's what a mapping looks like. Um, so I could say mapping, equals and then here we'll say mapping there we go so that's what we want so um <clears throat> this is basically our results right so i was thinking like an alternative way like mapping also map function also takes functions correct correct so... and i was i was avoiding that because that i mean i know it doesn't matter here but it's really slow so we oh, yes, okay we could also pass in a function um, but I was just thinking, like you could just have a function that just in indexes into the into the list or something correct, like that, correct? Like, a, so, like a lambda function or something like that. Exactly. Let's go ahead and and do that to see what it looks like. Um, but um, almost nobody knows that you can use a a dictionary or a mapping. So almost everybody on Kaggle uses a function, and um, often it can take a very 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 long time to run at you know on big data sets. So yeah, you could also have a lambda. And so that's going to be passed in um, each index, and you would just want to um, return uh, the dls.vocab at i. Um, so that does the same thing. Now, obviously, this is tiny, so it doesn't actually matter, but I thought I'd try to show the neat trick, which almost nobody knows about, which is the mapping. Okay, so um, we basically want to. Uh, use uh, that as our labels. Um, 
So I think we can go SS label equals dots. There we go. Okay. So, you know, normally at this point, I would like visually check some results. And the easiest way to visually check some results is to go learn.show results. Um, um, and this is showing me the actual and the predicted, and the accuracy is very high, so these are all correct. The problem is I don't know which of these are right and which are wrong, so I have no idea what to look for. So I don't have that ability to do my normal checking. Um, okay, so we can save this as a CSV submission. There we go. Okay. Um, so there's a few things we could do here. I guess probably the easiest one would be to um, use the Kaggle CLI. Um, I was going to note something uh, yeah. for the submission or for the two CSV. I think you might have to do index equals oh, false because. Exactly right. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, normally I sh what I always do after that, except this time, which I forgot, is to do exclamation mark head to show me the first few lines. And yeah, so now we would see, as Tanish says, we've got this extra column out the front, um, which is because the default is that it shows kind of the, the, the row number. Thanks, Tanish. And so that will fix it. And if we compare that to their sample, yeah, it looks nice and similar. So that's good. Um, so these are all kind of steps in the same thing. So I might pop these all together. And then we might do a bit of item. And um, cd to git patty. And um, there's that submission file. Oh, and there's no Kaggle installed on this machine. That's a bit surprising. Okay, uh, so generally minus help or minus minus, sorry, minus H or minus minus help normally gives you a quick version of help. And so um, we're going to want to do something with competitions. Competitions. Okay, there we go. And so we're going to want to do a submission. All right, we need a file for upload, and we're going to need the competition. And so I could go Kaggle competitions list pipe grep patty. And that way I don't even have to. Oh, that's not what I expected to happen. Oh, I bet it pages it. Okay, so rather than grep, we should use minus s. And it's going to use a regular expression or something, is it? Have a look at a few examples. Okay, so there's definitely something called spaceship. Spaceship. Hmm. All right. Um, I will go to Goku over here after all. And this is what it's called. So I don't know. Oh, is it not active, probably? That's why. It's active. Yeah, it is active. Um, and I don't think it ought to matter. Is it because it's like not really uh, actually organized by Kaggle? Maybe it only lists yeah. the ones that are organized by Kaggle. Or we need uh, a capital so letter. Category all is fine, but maybe it's group. Maybe this is considered in class. Don't know. Yeah. Um, anywho, so we were going to do a submission. 
and so we need to provide the file name minus f. Oh, full path. That's a bit weird. Um, Addy slash file name. Um, okay, and a message minus m initial conf next conf next small to epoch fine tune. Okay, and then the competition and go. Took a while for a 70k file, but so be it. Okay, so let's see if it's there. It is. How did we do? Oh, I see. Oh, here, I jumped to your leaderboard position. 157 out of 167. So I'm guessing that there's a problem with our submission because it's. I think maybe what happened was the test files were not like they got shuffled somehow hmm. like maybe when you did get image files it got shuffled or something like that hmm. i think sometimes that might happen yeah that's a good question uh, yeah 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 that looks like that seems very likely um so we didn't do a great job of checking as we went yes so they were expecting that 2001 would be first, and we have 2000, 300,919 first. So that is not ideal. Um, yeah, this has happened to me sometimes too. Cool. It would be nice if get image files by default return things in a more sensible order. Um, anyway, it's good to. Um, see these problems you know we could just sort it right um but it looks like it works it probably does work as long as they've got exactly the same number as long as they're all one two three four five six digits if some of them are different numbers of digits we would we can't sort it because this is sorting in string order um but yeah maybe that's okay says dot tail does it have a tail yes two oh three four six nine two oh three four six nine yeah okay Maybe we're fine then. Um, so sorted, oh, whoopsie daisy, sorted um, returns the sorted version, whereas sort sorts in place. Okay, so got those. 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 Okay. And so it's very nice to, yeah, have things set up, you know, that you're doing things from the command line and notebooks and stuff so that when you screw up, which, you know, if you're anything like me, you always screw up. Um, you can pretty quickly um, repeat the process. So I just hit up arrow and just add sorted to our message, both literally and figuratively, hopefully. Welcome to the leaderboard. <laughs> not a not a very successful welcome, but okay. Oh, it's a bit better, isn't it? Point nine one. 
There we go. A good start. About in the middle. All right. So does anybody have questions about, um, yeah, this process of I see Mike had a question in the chat and I had the same problem um, All right. when PIP installing Tim. Um, yeah. we, this is in paper space. Yeah. Um, I assume Mike was the same. Uh, we can see the list of models, yeah. but it, it doesn't actually create the learner. It says name Tim is not defined. Uh, so you need to, um, so so um... actually, uh, I, I was able to do that, um, Matt. I, I just restarted my kernel. Yeah, so just to explain, when you see in Python something is not defined, it, it means what it says. It means that that symbol, Python doesn't know what it is. And so there are um, two ways, basically, to define a symbol, to create a symbol. One is to say something like a equals 1, and that defines a symbol called a. right? Or another is to do something like def, def, and that defines a symbol called F, right? Uh, or the other way to define symbols is to import them. So in this case, Tim is not defined means you have not imported Tim. And that will solve your problem. Does that make sense? Um, yes, it does, but I, yeah, it, it sort of, I was, importing Tim and uh, running that command, I don't think it was working still. It will definitely work. If you say import Tim, this will definitely work. So I'd say you might've reset your kernel or something and hadn't rerun really that cell. Um, yeah, if you say- If you, import, if you restart the kernel, it works. Yeah, if you say import module. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, I mean, the other possibility is um, that you might've got a different message, which is something like this, module not found. And module not found means, um, yeah, either you haven't pip installed it, or if you have pip installed it, you might need to restart your kernel by clicking kernel restart. Um, so it can like recheck what modules you have since you just installed it. That's so, what I had. Okay. Got it. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, that was pretty successful even if paper space wasn't. Um, thanks guys. Uh, and uh, see you, yeah, see you tomorrow. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.